Good afternoon. The uh, first item of business is portfolio questions, and the first portfolio is justice and veterans. Uh, if any member would wish to request a supplementary uh, question, they should enter. Uh, they should press the request to speak button during the relevant question, or enter the letter R in the chat function during the relevant question. Again, I would call for succinct questions and answers to match. I call question number one, Jim Fairley. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I would like to ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to support greater use of community justice interventions. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, for nearly 15 years, this Government has delivered bold, effective justice reforms with a firm focus on early intervention, prevention and rehabilitation. We are currently consulting publicly on a revised national strategy for community justice which seeks to build on progress to date and encourage a further shift towards greater use of community-based disposals. Jim Fairley. <coughs> I would like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Can he share with me how the commitments in the Promise Implementation Plan and the recently launched consultation on the Children's Care and Justice Bill support greater use of community justice amongst children and young people? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as the question implies, we owe it to Scotland's young people as well as to victims and to communities to promote an evidence-led, progressive, continually improving approach. So both the Promise Implementation Plan and the consultation on the Children's Care and Justice Bill, uh, which will be the responsibility of Claire Hockey, uh, demonstrate our determination to support children coming into conflict with the law through age-appropriate systems and services. Our Promise Implementation Plan makes clear we will end the placement of 16- and 17-year-olds in young offenders institutions without further delay. We are also committed to fund care-based alternatives to custody and are consulting on new legislation. Our proposals for the Children's Care and Justice Bill include raising the maximum age of referral to the principal reporter to help ensure that where any child requires the support and intervention of formal systems, age-appropriate support is available through the children's hearing system. We also intend to enhance the offer to victims, ensuring appropriate protection, support and information. And these actions taken together build on the clear synergies between our Youth Justice Vision published in June 21 and the Justice Vision published in February. We look forward to expanding a successful whole system approach and focusing on intensive residential and community alternatives across Scotland. A supplementary, Russell Finlay. Yeah, thank you. Prison is often more appropriate than community service for some criminals, but sheriff's hands are being tied. Retired Sheriff Douglas Cuisine describes the frustrating inadequacy of SNP sentencing policies, which he says will be weakened further with plans to automatically release some prisoners even earlier. On occasion, he has passed community services when he thought prison was necessary. So will Keith Brown back our plans to end automatic early release so that criminals can be jailed when a judge deems it appropriate? Cabinet Secretary. First of all, criminals can be jailed when a judge deems it appropriate. But I see, in addition to attacking the independent Lord Advocate, attacking the independent parole board, attacking the independence of the police, that we now have the Tories attacking the Sentencing Council for Scotland. So it's quite clear there's a broad-based approach to attack the justice system as a whole in Scotland, perhaps prompted by, of course, the headlines we see down south, which says that the justice system is in complete freefall uh, in the rest of the UK. That may be the motivation. But it is simply the case, if you look at the figures, that in reducing reoffending, community disposals are far more effective. And surely you would have thought that we would all, including victims, want to see a reduction in crime. And the most effective way to do that is where we can to use community-based disposals, and we'll continue to do so. Question number two, Sandish Gohani. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the Scottish Veterans Commissioner's most recent report on the health and well-being of veterans. Cabinet Secretary. I have written to the Commissioner thanking him for advance sight of the report on veterans' health and wellbeing, and over the coming weeks we will consider carefully its recommendations. Uh, I will in due course write to the Commissioner again, although it will be the new Commissioner at that point, uh, to provide a more detailed response, and our action plan for taking forward the recommendations will also be included in that response. I would also like to again take the opportunity to thank uh, Charlie for all his hard work and dedication to the veterans community in Scotland, and to wish him all the best for the future. Sandish Gohani. Thank you. I have been in contact with Poppy Scotland, who once again highlighted the importance of veterans' mental health. They mentioned the Veteran Commissioner's report, which states that mental health is the most common unmet need that has caused frustration amongst veterans. In November last year, the Scottish Veterans Care Network published their Mental Health and Wellbeing Action Plan for Veterans, but the Scottish Government have yet to provide a timeline for the delivery of these recommendations. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide the timeline today, please? 
Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I should say we are establishing the veteran-led implementation board for the plan, which will be led by Charles Wynne Stanley. I'm not sure if that information was yet in the public domain. And the first meeting of that board is scheduled for the 19th of May. Uh, we are, in the meantime, continuing to fund both Combat Stress and Veterans First Point, which will allow existing services to continue over the next year as a Scotland-wide implementation plan is developed. And support for that uh, board is currently being reviewed with the Minister for Mental Wellbeing and Social Care. But in addition, we have commissioned CME to run a veterans anti-stigma campaign this year. Uh, veterans Scotland and other third sector partners will be contributing to this work to ensure that the experience of veterans shape, uh, uh, they can help uh, shape and influence the campaign. It would be useful, though, uh, given Sandy Kilhani's question, if he was able to support the Scottish Government in the call to the UK Government to pay some money towards the establishment of the Commissioner's Office. They have done so in Wales. I don't know what the logic is for the UK Tory government to say we will not fund a veterans activity in Scotland and not fund a commissioner. So if he is willing to say he will support that, that would be most, most welcome. Supplementary, Fulton McGregor. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. And following on from the last question, um, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary how the £2 million funding announced last month for services that provide mental health support to armed forces veterans has been put to use? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the government is committed to ensuring that veterans have access to the right support and help when they need it. So the government works with a wide range of organisations and provides funding for the provision of mental health services for veterans. And this year, I mentioned in the previous answer, we have continued to fund combat stress. That is £1.4 million of funding to combat stress who provide, as a member knows, a range of specialist and community-based services for veterans res resident in Scotland. We are also continuing to provide joint funding along with six local health boards for the Veterans First Point Network, which will offer the one-stop shop for veterans no matter what their need is. And the future funding of veterans' mental health services in Scotland will be determined by the implementation of the Scottish Veterans Mental Health Action Plan, which was published uh, late last year. Question number three, Willie Rennie. To ask the Scottish Government what work it and Police Scotland have undertaken to ensure that police officers have access to additional trained mental health workers. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Action 15 of the Mental Health Strategy commits to fund 800 additional mental health workers in key settings. And as at the 1st of January 2022, we have achieved 95 per cent of this target. That includes over 26 whole-time equivalent posts to support those held in police station custody suites. Uh, police officers and staff can themselves access mental health support, including a 24-7 Help Employees Scheme programme, EAP, which offers professional support via a team of trained wellbeing and counselling practitioners. And also the Trauma Risk Management or TRIM process supports officers and staff affected by potentially traumatic incidents at work. Willie Rennie. A survey found that 29 per cent of officers were experiencing moderate burnout, and a further 16 per cent endured high levels of burnout, and one-third of officers went to work when they were mentally unwell. Police Scotland has, as the Minister has just referred to, an employment, employee assistant programme, which aims to help officers with their mental health. If officers may need more support than the six one-hour sessions, they are told there is nothing more for them. So why have the worst affected officers been left without the support that they deserve? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we, Police Scotland work, of course, it is a Police Scotland responsibility directly, although it is the Government's responsibility, I am sure, as Willie uh, Rennie would say, for the Government to help to fund these things. But Police Scotland works with a range of local and national service providers to provide the care and assistance to those in distress. And we fund a wide range of mental health services uh, that can be accessed by first responders. So I have mentioned the £2.1 million to expand, expand the NHS 24 mental health hub to be, be available to the public 24-7, uh, and the £1 million uh, to roll out the distress brief intervention programme on a national basis is also worth mentioning. It is also worth saying that there are additional um, supports for uh, officers who can take on further uh, assistance. I mentioned EAP, but also the trim process. Uh, and beyond that, it is always open to officers to speak to uh, those designated within the force in their area about issues which they have. And that covers not just uh, mental health, uh, well, uh, mental and physical health well-being, but all sorts of other issues which may cause uh, stress, whether that is money or or traumatic incidents which the officers have had to encourage. So we will continue to fund these services for police officers. At the same time, of course, as having more police officers than virtually anywhere else in the UK, and also officers paid substantially more than anywhere else in the UK. Question number four, Natalie Don, who is joining us remotely. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it is making available to specialist services for victims and survivors of crime. 
Cabinet Secretary. So our Victim Centred Approach Fund is providing £48 million to 23 organisations across Scotland over the period 22, 2022 to 2025. And that will fund specialist services for people bereaved by crime. It will extend support and assistance for victims of human trafficking. And it includes £18.5 million for specialist advocacy support for survivors of gender-based violence. We are also providing £38 million to over 120 projects through the Delivering Equally Safe Fund, tackling violence against women and girls, and supporting frontline services that maximise their safety and well-being. And I think that underpins our commitment to victims and survivors, which is a key priority in our recently published strategy for Scotland's justice sector. Natalie Dunn. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that, for that answer. I know there are many valuable organisations receiving funding, and I am sure this will provide essential support to many victims of crime. From speaking with organisations and my own personal dealings with constituents, it has been highlighted to me that there is a concern around support and stigma for people who are victims of facial disfigurement and facial scarring. Could the Cabinet Secretary provide any information or assurance on how this funding could be used to support these victims? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, happy to do so, but I would say to Natalie Don that she may be interested and she may be aware of the fact, of course, that in Baroness Helena Kennedy's recent report on misogyny, she has recommended action that could be taken in relation to people who purposefully disfigure, in particular, uh, women. She'd be interested, I'm sure, in that. But on this important issue and recognising the profound impact, both where someone receives a facial injury as a result of crime or where those with facial disfigurements are very unfortunately on the receiving end of abuse. In both these cases, we would expect that funded organisations would be able to provide practical and emotional support, but also that they would refer to more specialist support, including through health services, where that is available. So we will continue to work with funded organisations as a community of interest to ensure these issues are recognised, and I would welcome any specific suggestions uh, from Natalie Dawn as to how this might be done most effectively, including how we might build a better understanding and evidence base around these concerns. Supplementary, Jimmy Green. Uh, thank you. Victims tell us uh, that where the system is currently letting them down is the horrifying scenario where they bump into an offender in their community after they've been released from prison. Far too few of them are being notified about the release of an offender, and that's a fact. Can I ask if the current city is willing to redress this? by supporting two principles in my Victims' Bill. The first is ensuring that more victims are notified about the release of prisoners upon release. And secondly, the victims are further empowered to apply and request exclusion zones around their communities to ensure that they are not further being traumatised by simply bumping into someone in a supermarket. Cabinet Secretary. I think these suggestions have been made before by Jamie Green, and I do not want to dismiss them out of hand. I am happy to consider those. I am happy to look at, when it is available, the Members' uh, Bill, which has been mentioned, the Victims' Bill, by Jamie Green in detail when that comes forward. Um, I think there is a case that we have to increase the level of notification, make sure it is more consistently applied. I am happy to uh, concede that point and to say that we are doing things just now which will uh, do that. It is also true in relation to other aspects, which, I, again, Jamie Green has raised in the past, for example, at parole board hearings, uh, that kind of notification as well. So, happy to take on board those points, to continue those discussions. It is being done just now, currently, in terms of notification. We should be done, make sure it is done more comprehensively, but happy to have that discussion. Supplementary, Pauline McNeill. Thank you. Some victims of sexual assault have said that they feel like criminals in the trial process. And in the Vision for Justice, um, I welcome the commitment to improve communication with complainers uh, on a single trauma-informed source of contact. Can the Cabinet Secretary uh, confirm that, that this will be treated with some urgency by the Scottish Government? But would you also consider the inclusion of some legal representation within that process? Because one of the things that concerns me is that you do need to have an understanding of the legal system when you are talking to, to victims and complainers uh, that myself and Katie Clark have been proposing. Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, I think it is a very important point that has been made by Paula McNeill here. In relation to people's ability to understand the legal process, we have had discussions in this chamber about not proven when it has been conceded that judges cannot even explain to a jury. Uh, they are not allowed to explain the difference between not proven and not guilty. If people do not understand the system, then that is a major problem, even if it is the case that all the lawyers understand it. If people do not understand it, that is who it is meant to serve. So there is uh, some sympathy for what Polly McNeill says. All I would say in relation to legal representation 
uh, for complainers. There are some compelling arguments. There are some concerns, including those from the legal profession. But we are looking at that very urgently. We will be publicising uh, our thoughts on that very shortly. I am looking for additional suggestions. So happy to look at it. We are not ruling it out, uh, but it is a complex area. I am happy to continue with those discussions. And supplementary, Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how the Sexual Assault Response Coordination Service, known as SARCs, will help those who have experienced a sexual crime. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, SARCs is, of course, a dedicated NHS service that can offer health care and support in the days after rape or sexual assault if a person is not ready or is unsure whether to report it to the police, and that is called, of course, self referral. Uh, through the Chief Medical Officers Rape and Sexual Assault Task Force, we have invested £11.7 million in the four years up to 2022 to support implementation of the Forensic Medical Services Victims of Sexual Offences Scotland Act 2021 and to either enhance or create SARCs across Scotland. And we know from listening to survivors that access to self-referral is an important aspect of giving people back control. It is also a fundamental aspect of the Forensic Medical Examination Facilities, which we are looking to roll out. And of course, that may positively influence a person's decision to report to the police whilst ensuring that they are also able to access health care services following an incident. Question number five, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I remind the Chamber I am a practising solicitor. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the Scottish Solicitors Bar Association's announcement that criminal solicitors will no longer take on court appointments for those accused without lawyers who are not allowed to represent themselves. Minister Ashraf. Uh, we are, of course, very concerned about the effect of the boycott, boycott on court users and on justice partners. Uh, officials met with the President and the Chief Executive of the Law Society of Scotland on the 13th of April to discuss wider legal aid fee issues in light of the profession's call for a further increase to all legal aid fees of 50%. Now, whilst the budget for legal aid cases is demand-led, the Scottish Government allocates a budget to the Legal Aid Fund, and in 2021-22, this was £138 million. So a 50 per cent uplift would add £57 million per year to the fund, and uh, that is unaffordable given the current pressures on public finance. I have been informed that the meeting was constructive and that it is hoped that the Law Society will report back on it soon. And the Scottish Government um, will also continue to engage with the Scottish Solicitors Bar Association and the Law Society of Scotland on a package of proposals worth uh, £3.8 million, which were offered to target specific areas of solemn and summary legal aid fees, which had previously been raised by the profession as the most pressing of fee-related issues. Dinker. Thank the Minister for the answer. Now, this SSBA action, which they have been forced to take by SNP government neglect, will lead to some of those accused of sexual and domestic abuse being unrepresented. And that means further trial delays for victims of the most shocking crimes who may have to wait years for justice. Now, criminal defence lawyers tell me that after 15 years of SNP government, the system is collapsing and there has been a fundamental failure to address shortages in their profession. So when will the Scottish Government actually start listening to the profession in these meetings that the Minister describes, properly invest in legal aid to reverse these shortages and finally start tackling Scotland's huge court backlog? Minister. I would not accept the member's characterisation of the situation that we are in at the moment. and I would um, say to the member that I do listen to the legal profession um, regularly and often, and I, I take great care in listening to all the arguments that they put forward and in trying to address um, the issues that they have. Uh, the member at, at a point there raised um, the issues of capacity in the system, and I would remind the member that, of course, the government invested £1 million into the traineeship fund uh, quite recently. Um, we also had the 5% legal aid fee rise in 2021 and a further 5% in place from this month. Now, that represents um, more than £10 million rise in legal aid fees just in this last year alone. So I think the government is listening to the profession and it is continuing to invest. I am, of course, I am very, um, um, I am very concerned about the situation that is going on at the moment, about the recent developments, and I would um, assure the Chamber that officials and myself are continuing to discuss this with representatives of the profession on further fee reforms. But I would say to the member, and I would say this to the Chamber as well, that eligibility levels in Scotland and the wide scope that remains in Scotland is quite different to the situation that is in England, 
where the Conservatives, of course, are in charge of the legal aid system there, where it has been cut, cut and cut again. So I think it is a stark difference, the situation that we have in Scotland and the situation that Conservatives are presiding over in the rest of the country. Absolutely. Question number six, Martin Whitfield. <laughs> I am very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what measures it is taking in response to the reported growing threat of cybercrime. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, we continue to work closely with Police Scotland and other Cyber Scotland partners, including the National Cyber Security Centre, to protect the public and organisations from cyber threats. In addition to that ongoing activity, we, uh, which I highlighted to the Chamber on 26 January, Given the current heightened cyber risk, the Scottish Government is currently working with the National Cyber Security Centre to deliver a national cyber aware campaign which seeks to educate the public on the following two actions everyone should take to keep themselves secure online. The first to underline that your email is where you keep your most personal and financial information. We ask that everyone should ensure they have a strong and separate password for their email address using three random words as a recommendation that can't be easily guessed. The second action is to enable two-step verification on your account so that criminals cannot access your account even if they have your password. Uh, and further information on these measures and other uh, relevant aspects is available on the cyberscotland.com portal. And victims of any crime should phone Police Scotland on 101. Martin Whitfield. I am very grateful for the Cabinet Secretary's response, and in particular the response individuals should take. But recent years have shown that our cyber infrastructure has been tested by ongoing cyber attacks. We think obviously of the Scottish Environment Protection Agency back in 2020. With the ongoing war in Eastern Europe raging on, can the Cabinet Secretary state what steps have been taken to audit and improve Scotland's cyber security from the possibility of state-sponsored Russian attacks or indeed criminal organisations based in Russia who may use this conflict as a reason for attacks? And also, what discussions has the Cabinet Secretary had with their counterpart in the UK Government? Cabinet Secretary. The, and I'm sure uh, Martin Wilford would expect this. There has been substantial discussion with uh, the UK Government uh, and actually very good uh, collaboration. So, although we have, for example, invested uh, additional £1.5 million setting up the centre that I mentioned before, that's on top of £1.16 million, which will inv invest in further in the vision of the strategic framework for a cyber resilient Scotland. Although we're doing those things, they're building on what's been done with the UK government. It's been done in collaboration. It has to be. Many of the powers, of course, are reserved, so it makes sense to do that. And there's a very effective relationship. Uh, he mentioned, of course, the attack on SEPA. There have been ones in Ireland on uh, public authorities there, and that's a very big concern for the Scottish government to make sure that our public authorities are as secure as they can be. So, much of this work is led in government by the Deputy First Minister. We take it extremely seriously. And just to reassure the member, there is a very effective relationship with the UK government on this issue. Question number seven, Co-Cap Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to ask the Scottish Government how measures in the Water Safety Action Plan will support awareness of water safety amongst school pupils. Minister. We are working with stakeholders to improve uh, water safety on several fronts, including awareness. And some measures, such as work to improve signage, should benefit all age groups, and others focus specifically on children and young people. For example, coinciding with the National Fire Chiefs Council's Be Water Aware campaign, next week we will see the launch of age and stage appropriate water safety education lessons developed by Education Scotland and Water Safety Scotland. And the resource to be hosted on the Education Scotland National Improvement Hub aims to support those between the age of 3 to 18 to develop valuable life-saving knowledge, skills and understanding. I thank the Minister for that response. As people uh, continue to take advantage of the great outdoors, I would like to ask the Minister what work has been undertaken on Scotland's drowning prevention strategy to support safe open water swimming. Minister. Uh, the 2018 to 2026 Drowning Prevention Strategy is a collaborative piece of work between Water Safety Scotland and its members, and it is complemented by the Stakeholder Action Plan, which I launched last month. And both in, uh, approaches are informed by an appreciation of the challenges of open water swimming, and they are very different to those of indoor pools because of risks posed by things like currents obstacles and, of course, and importantly, cold water shock. 
A key focus has to be on education and raising awareness, and both documents set out the work that is being done in this area. And there's always value, of course, in that practical experience, which is why one of the actions identified in the action plan is for a subgroup on Water Safety Scotland to review the scope for developing expanded opportunities for young people to experience being safe in open water environments. And the Scottish Government has enhanced the funding available to ROSPA, which supports Water Safety Scotland, so that such work can be progressed as quickly as possible. Meantime, a range of site-specific work is being undertaken um, by relevant authorities. For example, the Loch Lomond and Trossachs National Parks uh, Authority's water safety campaign will highlight the importance of wearing buoyancy aids or life jackets when participating in all water sports and focus on being visible in the water for open water swimmers. A brief supplementary, Evelyn Tweed. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government for an update on the rollout of the new water safety promotions targeting high risk areas such as the lochs and reservoirs in the Loch Lomond and Trossachs National Park within my constituency. Minister, I think you may have dealt with some of that already, but so briefly, please, thank you. Yes, it is, of course, a pertinent question raised by the member, given the tragedies that have occurred in the National Park in recent years. Um, the National Park Authority has developed a water safety policy and an accompanying risk assessment procedure, formalising its approach on its owned and managed land, and it's now upgraded and installed public rescue equipment and signage at sites around Loch Lomond. And I saw some of this myself when I was at Ballach for the launch of the action plan last month. And the follow-up phase involves assessing and addressing sites out with the immediate Loch Lomond area. And I can squeeze in question number eight if I have brief questions and answers. Question eight, Douglas Nunsen. Thank you, President. Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what role prisons have in the assessment of prisoners, including of their mental health, prior to their release. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, people in custody are subject to a range of assessments whilst in prison, including talk to me and their general well-being. Uh, NHS provide access to appropriate mental health support and assessment, including more specialist care where that's appropriate. SPS work collaboratively on pre-release arrangements with community partners, and this facilitates access to people in its care to support multidisciplinary assessment, for example, to access through care services. Douglas Lumsden. Uh, thank you, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Um, in December 2019, Stuart Quinn was released from Peterhead Prison, and the next day in Aberdeen, he murdered devoted dad, Alan Geddes. I keep in touch with Alan's sister, Sandra, who strongly believes that her brother would still be alive today if Quinn's previous convictions and psychopathic behaviour had been properly assessed and there are lessons to be learned to ensure something that this never happens again. Will the Cabinet Secretary meet with myself and Alan's family to discuss what more can be done to improve the system when a prisoner with a serious unresolved mental health issue is released from prison. Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I first extend my uh, condolences to uh, Mr Geddes' family and say yes, of course, I'm willing to meet with the member uh, and the family that's concerned. Uh, and also to say this is, of course, an extremely difficult thing to do. And it is the case that we should always continue to improve uh, over time because, as in this case, people's lives can depend on that. So happy to meet with the member and the family concerned. Thank you. That concludes uh, portfolios on justice and veterans. We now move straight to portfolio questions on finance and the economy. I'll allow a very short pause for front benchers to quickly change their seats. Thank you. So, uh, as I say, the next portfolio is finance and the economy. And if any member would wish to request a supplementary question, they should press the request to speak button or enter the letter R in the chat function during the relevant question. I call question number one, Emma Roddick. To ask the Scottish Government whether it has had any feedback from businesses that are making use of financial support to trial a four-day working week. Minister Richard Lockhead. The pandemic has intensified interest in flexible working practices, and we have, of course, seen the positives of, of adopting alternative working practices for a better work-life balance as well, and we recognise there are many other benefits to a four-day work, four working week also. Therefore, the Government has committed to establishing a £10 million fund to allow companies to pilot and explore the costs and benefits of moving to a shorter four-day working week, and we are committed to developing a comprehensive design for the pilot over the next year, supported by initial £500,000 of funding. Emma Roddick. I thank the Minister for that answer. Does he agree that UK employment policy is not fair for workers? and that rather than relying on a callous Tory government which cares little for those who bear the brunt of its outdated, race-to-the-bottom policies which harm workers and deregulate an already skewed market, 
This pilot, which puts welfare and the mental health impact of a good work-life balance at its heart, demonstrates that Scotland could do better if we had powers over employment law. Minister. Yes, I agree with everything Emma Roddick has said. And of course, the recent P&O scandal has highlighted that UK employment policy uh, has, uh, should be improved dramatically. Uh, having employment powers devolved to the Scottish Parliament allow us to protect and enhance workers' rights, including, for instance, making a minimum wage a real living wage and tackling the inappropriate use of zero-hours contracts, to give but two examples. Uh, and we are doing what we can within our limited devolved powers, uh, such as piloting a four-day working week to bring the benefits that Emma Roddick uh, gives as examples. A supplementary, Mercedes Bialba. Thank you. It is clear from the trials that a four-day working week provides benefits to workers and businesses like better work-life balance and greater productivity. The Scottish Government has the power to introduce a four-day week into the public sector, so can the Minister confirm when the Government will expand four-day working week trials into the public sector, and can the Minister confirm if workers in non-unionised workplaces, like many of those in the hospitality sector, will be covered by future trials? Minister. Um, as I said in my response to Emma Roddick, we agree there are many benefits potentially from uh, introducing a four-day working week, and that is why we are taking the uh, very ambitious and radical step of piloting at uh, the cost of £10 million in this Parliament um, a pilot to look at the, the costs and benefits of a four-day working week in, in, in Scotland. And indeed, several Scottish businesses uh, are already choosing to switch to a four-day working week with no cut in pay, and officials from the Government have been meeting with and gathering information from these companies. Uh, and also, there are pilots underway elsewhere in the UK and other European countries as well. And we'll get evidence from those, and we'll take into account the points that the, the members raised as we take forward the arrangements for the pilots. Question number two, Gillian Mackay, who is joining us remotely. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking, <coughs> pardon me, to implement the Fair Work Convention's recommendations on building fair work in the construction industry. Minister Richard Lockett. Uh, the Scottish Government is supporting plans for a more sustainable, productive, innovative and diverse industry, and we very much welcome the results of the Fair Work Convention's construction industry inquiry. And we do thank the Fair Work Convention and its construction industry inquiry group for the extensive research they have undertaken. And of course, the inquiry makes a range of recommendations on how to enhance the sector's fair work and to remain competitive, making it more appealing to workers, and these are being considered by ministers. The vision for Scotland, of course, is to be a leading fair work nation by 2025, where fair work drives success, well-being and prosperity for people, businesses, organisations and society. And we look forward to considering the recommendations of that particular report. Julian Mackay. Thank the Minister for that answer. Given the extent of subcontracting within construction, has the Scottish Government considered mechanisms to go further and ensure that fair work criteria is implemented throughout the construction supply chain and not just to those employed directly in public procurement? Minister. Jill Mackay raises uh, an important theme, and yes, we are giving further consideration about how subcontractors and contractors can uh, be subject to fair work first criteria uh, and so on. And already the Scottish Government is or, uh, now asking fair work questions for particip participants who are part of tender submissions, and it is the intention that the delivery of any commitments made, including fair work criteria, will be monitored throughout the construction projects that are taking place in Scotland. And also in the forthcoming civil engineering framework, the Government will also be trialling a performance monitoring regime, which will review on a very regular basis prompt payment and community benefits in all projects awarded under that particular framework. And the Scottish Government's civil engineering framework will be tendered later this year. And supplementary, Jamie Halper Johnson. Uh, the Minister will be aware of the Convention's um, observations that the existing labour force in the sector is ageing, around 85 per cent male, with low numbers of ethnic minorities and people with disabilities represented. If the sector is to be expected to support significant goals like house building and meeting uh, net zero, a new generation will have to be brought in. So can the Minister comment on what he's doing and what cross-government work is taking place to promote the sector and build the skills needed for the future? Minister. Uh, my colleague, the Skills Minister, regularly meets the trade association bodies to the construction sector, as do other ministers, and also we meet the training providers, as well as the further and higher education sector, to discuss the, the, some of the challenges facing the construction sector in Scotland at the moment, which, of course, um, like many other sectors in Scotland, has had to cope with the fallout from Brexit, uh, as well as the pandemic, and, and so on. 
So I can assure the member that right across government that this is something we are considering, is how to help not just the construction sector, but many of our sectors in terms of recruitment and some of the labour challenges to face. Question number three, Graeme Simpson. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how much it is allocated in its budget for port upgrades ahead of holes 801 and 802 being completed. Minister Ivan McKee. Uh, over £580 million pounds investment to support and improve Scotland's ferry services is announced as part of our wider five-year infrastructure investment plan in February 2021. That includes £306 million pounds for improvements to piers and harbours, which incorporates both the Ardrossan and Sky Triangle infrastructure projects. The majority of this investment is driven by replacing uh, life-expired infrastructures and supports the delivery of the two new and future vessels, thus enabling increased flexibility across the ferry network. Graeme Simpson. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? In order for the Glen Sanox to use our Drossen, uh, the port needs to be upgraded. But um, it has been stuck for four years. There has been a ministerial task force which has been uh, in existence for four years, and yet the scheme still has not gone out to tender. That process will take six months because the overall package of funding is yet to be agreed. Once work starts, that will take another two years. So why is this project still marooned? Minister. Uh, the the, the Ardrossan project has faced a number of challenges in the planning and design phase, notwithstanding the legal and commercial discussions with the statutory Harbour Authority Peel Ports Group, which continue with uh, Transport Scotland. The project um, is uh, now in entering the tender stage, and that was confirmed at the recent Ardrossan Task Force meeting on the 23rd of, of February this year, uh, which was welcomed. And we remain committed to finding a solution at Ardrossan that can deliver in a cost-effective way, meeting the needs of all partners involved. A supplementary, Kenneth Gibson. Officer. Does the Minister agree that the reason why a Drossen Harbour's upgrade is dragged on for years is the difficult ongoing negotiations with Peel Ports, which is just touched on, and that such a scenario would not exist if the Tories hadn't privatised Clydeport, ultimately leading to the Scottish Government have to deal with a company for whom the bottom line is paramount? Minister. Uh, the, the Member makes a very interesting observation, and um, it is uh, Absolutely the case that, uh, as I mentioned in my earlier answer, we are committed to finding a solution at Ardrossan, but there have been significant delays um, uh, in those legal and commercial discussions with the uh, Peel Ports have taken some, some considerable amount of time. But, uh, as I said earlier, we are um, happy that the project is now entering the tender stage and uh, is moving forward. And supplementary, Rosa Grant, who is joining us remotely. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The alternative arrangements which are being put in place when Rig Harbour is being adapted will mean there will be a third less freight capacity from US. This is unacceptable, especially since the closure will last six months. It will impact on everybody on these islands and will put businesses in jeopardy. Will the Minister ensure that there will be no decrease in the freight capacity during the time of closure? And will he do everything in his power to speed up the time frame for those works? Minister. Indicated in my earlier answers, the Scottish Government is investing significant sums to upgrade, uh, support, and improve um, uh, infrastructure across, uh, across Scotland's ports. Um, and regards to the specific issue that the, uh, the member raises, I will ensure that my colleague, uh, the Transport Minister, picks up this issue and responds back to her with uh, the detail that she has requested. Question number four, Stephen Kerr. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what support it is offering to local authorities to help them maximise the amount of levelling up funding that they receive from the UK Government. Minister Richard Lockett. As the UK Government continues to develop and implement the levelling up fund without the consent, agreement or engagement of this Parliament or Scottish Ministers, the Scottish Government has been excluded from meaningful or formal involvement in that, and the lack of respect for devolution has been further exacerbated by the fact that this fund enters into devolved areas meaning the UK Government are encroaching into these matters that this Parliament was elected to deliver. We will, of course, work with our regional partners in all their endeavours, building on the close partnerships we have established since devolution. Stephen Kerr. Answer to my question in the Minister's response. In Falkirk, there has been a very welcome investment from the UK Government, funding what I call the magic roundabout at the Helix, which will open up investment opportunities at Junction 6 of the M9, 
There's a new regional growth deal in the offing and the hope of landing one of Scotland's two free ports at Grangemouth. At the same time, the Scottish Government has cut the funding for flood prevention and frozen the Council's capital grant. Are local councils like Falkirk to rely solely on the support of the UK Government to level up and power up their local areas? Minister. Well, presenting officer, if uh, the UK government, the Conservative UK government, had stuck to its pledges and its promises made to the people of Scotland to unsuccessfully persuade Scotland to vote for Brexit, then a lot more resource and a lot more money would be flowing to Falkirk and Central Scotland and the rest of the country. But instead, what we've seen is broken policies and the UK government tramping all over devolution and threatening democracy in this country. And I feel that if he requires more investment for his areas, he should be making strong representation to his good friends in the UK government. Minister, uh, sorry, um, supplementary, Siobhan Brown. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the UK Government failing to replace EU funding as promised, which will see South Asia shortchanged by £3.1 million? Minister Richard Lockett. Well, the UK Government has clearly failed to provide an appropriate replacement to EU funding, as we were promised if Brexit was to go ahead, not only in South Ayrshire, but across the whole of Scotland. And the members laughing. Stephen Kerr, for the record, is laughing as we make that point. And it's worth noting that our communities, our communities and our economy are losing out due to the broken promises of the government he supports. And the overall Scottish quantum for the UK's Shared Prosperity Fund, which was earmarked to succeed the European funds, is only £212 million over three years, with only £32 million in the first of those three years, which in anyone's book is an insufficient replacement for EU structural funds. And indeed, £36 million of that funding announced has already been ring-fenced to the UK Government's Multiply programme. Therefore, the UK Government has been let down, uh, so the UK Government has let down Scotland and indeed South Ayrshire and communities the length and breadth of this country. A supplementary co cap Stewart. Um, I would like to ask the Minister whether he agrees with me that the UK's so-called uh, Shared Prosperity Fund will distribute just £32 million around Scotland this year, whereas it is estimated that EU membership would have seen communities around Scotland benefit from funding of £183 million. And would he further agree that this adds financial insult to democratic injury for the people of Scotland? Minister Richard Lockett. The Tory government's betrayal of Scotland over this issue uh, is indeed an insult to democracy in this country and this parliament and this government. And I would ask the members on the Conservative benches in particular to remember that they are here to represent their constituents and not the UK government uh, in London. And it is the case that we are only getting £32 million as opposed to the £183 million we were expecting to replace the EU funds we are losing out on because of a Brexit that Scotland did not vote for. Question number five, Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what financial resources it has allocated to help those across the Fries and Galloway in the Scottish borders who are most impacted by the reported cost of living crisis. Minister Tom Arthur. The Scottish Government is taking a range of actions within our devolved powers to help people facing the impacts of higher energy bills, the increased cost of a weekly shop, the UK Government's national insurance hike and interest rate rises. Our £290 million cost of living package builds on existing support, giving £150 to all households receiving a council tax reduction, irrespective of what band their property is in, and £150 to all other households in a band A to D property by the end of April. This equates to almost £7.3 million in Dumfries and Galloway and £5.4 million in the Scottish borders. In 2021-22, we allocated £80.75 million to local authorities for Scottish child payment bridging payments worth £520 in both 2021 and 2022, reaching over 144,000 school-aged children as of December 2021. And our second child poverty delivery plan sets out how we will continue to tackle and reduce child poverty in Scotland including investing up to £10 million each year to mitigate the UK Government's benefit cap. Emma Harper. I thank the Minister for that answer. The cost of living crisis has been a decade in the making, with rising costs compounded by damage in Westminster austerity. 
Does the Minister agree that the UK Government should reverse the regressive national insurance tax hike, the £20 a week cut to universal credit, match the Scottish child payment UK wide and introduce a real living wage of £9.90 per hour? And can he outline what representations have been made to the UK Government on these matters? Minister. President officer, I agree that, given most of the relevant powers are reserved, the UK Government must do more to help households cope with the cost of living crisis. The Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Economy wrote to the Chancellor ahead of his spring statement with some vital proposals to address the cost of living crisis using those reserved powers, including a call to reinstate the £20 universal credit uplift. However, these were largely ignored and the Chancellor failed to take the opportunity to address the biggest challenges currently facing households. I would also agree that all workers should be paid at least the real living wage. Having employment powers in the hands of the Scottish Parliament would enable us to protect and enhance workers' rights, including making the minimum wage a real living wage. And we will continue to call on the UK Government to take action to devolve these crucial powers. In the meantime, we are already using the powers we do have. From 14 October 2021, we began mandating payment of the real living wage in Scottish Government contracts where it is a relevant and proportionate requirement. And through the Butte House Agreement and subject to the, uh, the limits on devolved competence, we will also make it a requirement for grant recipients to pay at least the real living wage. Question number six, Alexander Burnett, who is joining us remotely. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the rollout of the R100 programme in rural areas. Minister Tom Arthur. As of 31st March, 6,629 connections were delivered through R100 contract build and 1,875 through the Scottish Broadband Voucher Scheme, which ensured every address across Scotland, regardless of location, had the ability to access a superfast broadband connection. As Audit Scotland recognised, R100 contract build is hugely challenging with many premises in the hardest to reach locations. Instead of pursuing a lower technology solution, we chose to focus on delivering full fibre broadband that will underpin economic growth and connectivity for decades to come. Weather permitting deployment of 16 subsea cables to service 15 islands will begin shortly. Alexander Burnett. Uh, the Finance Secretary recently wrote to the Economy Committee stating that the Scottish Government has delivered has delivered its commitment to ensure that every home and business could access superfast broadband by the end of 2021. That's absolutely ludicrous. They expect people to believe this after failing to meet their own targets and delaying the R100 rollout by six years. Uh, and suddenly thousands of those in Aberdeenshire without a reliable broadband connection will not fall for this. Now, the Finance Secretary confirmed in an answer to me that only 15% of the 3.3 million that the voucher scheme has been handed out, and less than half a percent of eligible properties in the North East made applications. So will the Minister commit to extending the scheme so that the remaining 85% of the fund goes to those who need it? Minister. As the member will be available, the main scheme is still available. The interim scheme was extended to the 31st of March. There was an extensive advertising campaign, both local and national, to promote the interim scheme. And ultimately, take-up did not reflect a level of demand which would necessitate the continuation of the scheme. And more broadly, on the commitment to R100 by the end of last year, that was, of course, not solely about contracts. It was also regarding commercial undertakings and the voucher scheme. And as I made reference to, the voucher scheme is still in place. And I would also remind the member, as part of the R100, this government has committed £600 million of investment. And this compares, with, if I call correctly, £33.5 million of investment from the UK government. Supplementary, Liam MacArthur. Much. Uh, the interim voucher scheme, which did close last month, was intended to plug the gaps in the communities with the lowest uh, coverage uh, in the country, predominantly in the north of Scotland. Not only has the take-up of that uh, scheme been low, but it's also, from government figures, been demonstrated that the poorest amount of money has gone out to those in the north compared to the south and the central uh, region. Can the minister explain the logic of that? Minister. As I said, we are position with, as members are familiar with what the intentions behind the interim scheme was, um, we did extend the interim scheme. Its original deadline date was the uh, 31st of December last year. We extended it to March, but as I referenced and um, explained in my answer to Mr Burnett, 
Ultimately, demand was not of a sufficient level which we, where we judged that the scheme was justified in being continued. And supplementary, Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I have been contacted by constituents who have been informed that they may have to wait until 2026, as has already been raised, before getting connected to fibre broadband. And community fibre broadband and the voucher scheme alluded to already is currently not a viable option for them. Can I ask the Scottish Government how it is engaging with Openreach and other stakeholders, and what further opportunities to support rural communities connecting to fibre broadband are being considered? Minister. As part of our ongoing dialogue with Openreach, we continue to look for opportunities to accelerate contract build, particularly in rural areas where possible. Commercial investment also continues to play a key role in supporting digital connectivity, and our full fibre charter for Scotland is providing a platform for the Scottish Government and operators to work together to maximise full fibre coverage, including the recently announced extension of 100 per cent non-domestic rates relief to March 2034, surpassing a key charter commitment and offering the most extended period of rates relief in the UK. Given telecoms is wholly reserved to Westminster, we also continue to push the UK Government for greater flexibility on their plans for Scotland through Project Gigabit, as we believe their current approach is likely to once again leave behind some areas that need improved connectivity most. Question number seven, Annie Wells, who is joining us remotely. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the support it is providing to the high streets and businesses. Minister Tom Arthur. We published our joint response with COSLA to the independent report, A New Future for Scotland's Town Centres, on 13 April. It is a call to action for all who have an interest in the future of our towns, setting out some of the ways in which we can all do our part in rebuilding, re energising, and reimagining our towns. Since the start of the pandemic, businesses have benefited from over £4.6 billion in support from the Scottish Government. This includes COVID-19 non-domestic rates relief, which have saved businesses around £1.6 billion since 1 April 2020. We are continuing to provide 50 per cent retail, hospitality and leisure relief in the first three months of 2022-23, capped at £27,500 per ratepayer. This business support includes our £80 million COVID Economic Recovery Fund for local authorities to support local economies, the £6 million for the City Centre Recovery Fund and our Scotland Loves Local programme. Annie Wells. Following years of neglect by the SNP run Council and exasperated by COVID-19, Glasgow's high streets are in need of rejuvenation. We all know many small businesses were forced to suffer endless delays in accessing COVID-19 grants. Does the Minister agree with me that it is time we bring together a Glasgow City Council business forum which can address current issues in conjunction with businesses, as opposed to a top-down approach, so that Glasgow's businesses can engage effectively with the Council? Minister. The the heart, I believe, of town centre and indeed city centre regeneration is a place-based approach, and that involves in bringing all partners to the table. Business of all kinds, retail, hospitality, leisure, all key to vibrant and dynamic city centres, local authorities, economic development departments, chambers of commerce and indeed government. And that is a partnership approach that we have taken through the City Centre Recovery Task Force and government's continued engagement with other partners. Glasgow is a, is a dynamic and thriving city with a huge amount to offer. And I think anyone who walks around Glasgow will see that while it is facing the challenges that many city centres are facing due to the changing nature of retail, its potential is boundless. And I think we all have a duty in this parliament and indeed in terms of how we engage in talking about our city centres and town centres to talk them up and not talk them down yeah. to make cheap political points. Yeah. And I can squeeze in uh, question number eight if I have brief questions and answers. Question number eight, Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it has estimated the cost to Scotland of being removed from the European digital single market. Minister Ivan McKee. The Scottish Government understands the importance of the digital single market to Scotland's economic ambitions and one of the endless downsides of Brexit means Scotland was taken out of the digital single market against our wishes, which has resulted in a less stable environment for our 
businesses. The European Parliament estimates the potential gains of a digital single market could be in the region of 415 to 500 billion euros per year as a result of higher productivity due to faster flow of information, greater efficiency in traditional economic sectors and higher levels of e-commerce. Our most recent analysis suggests that for Scotland, a 1.9 per cent boost to GDP would be the equivalent to £2.9 billion. Pounds. Billy Coffey. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. Could he outline what the Scottish Government can do to overcome this ridiculously stupid and damaging decision taken by the Tory Government and help Scottish businesses to access the increasingly important digital markets that Europe provides? Minister. Uh, we will continue to work uh, where we can to influence uh, the misguided uh, policies of the UK Government to ensure that Scotland stays as close as possible to our European trading partners uh, through uh, digital uh, means and others. Um, we shall con continue to push to reverse uh, the idiocy of Brexit and we shall of course continue to campaign for an independent Scotland taking its place at the heart of Europe. Thank you. That concludes portfolio questions on finance and the economy. There will be a very short pause before we move to the next item of business. Thank you.